up in the morning at the break of day With his axe and the file and the lunch packed away Then he's off to the woods where he'll earn his pay It's all in the life of the woodsman He swings his axe with truth and grace To strengthen his arms and pound on his face And carry it with him till the day he dies There's a lesson to be learned from the woodsman Shaped by his hands Up to the next tree Firmly he stands The chips fly fast Each swing is true There's music in the movement Of the woodsman He swings his axe With truth and grace There's strength in his arm And fight on his face To carry it with him Till the day he dies There's a lesson to be learned Hi, I'm Bernie Weisgerber, and I've got an axe to grind. Today we're going to look at axes, but first I want to show you around the ranger station. We're here at the entrance to the historic Nine Mile Ranger Station. Now the U.S. Forest Service still uses this facility as a working ranger station. It was built in the 1930s by the CCC. Now, in my job as a historic preservation specialist, I get to fix these great buildings. Every job should be assessed for safety hazards so you don't have any accidents. Now, in our line of work, there's a couple of items I want to show you. First would be safety glasses, good leather work gloves, an approved hard hat, and always good stout leather boots. Now before we head up into the woods to start our work, we need to go back into the shop and fix a double bid axe properly. We're going to start with a look at hanging an axe, which is putting a new handle in it. This is a hickory handle by OP Link, very fine percussion handles. And what I'm doing now is I'm looking to see if the grain is correct. If the grain runs this way in a proper handle. And I want to see how straight the, the handle is. And this one looks really good. Now this is a double bit handle and it's a slim taper octagonal. I don't know if you can see but it's got flats cut on it. Now it helps you get purchase. This on the other hand is also a 28 inch double bit handle. And if you can see the grain runs the wrong way on it. Now if you picture this with percussion with the grain running that way, it's going to pop it loose under pressure. This doesn't have a good feel to it. It's also got a shellac on it instead of a wax, like the link handle. And it's got heartwood in it. And good hickory handles should not have any heartwood. They should only have the sapwood. You can see the transition between the two here. Today, what I've got for you is an older double bit western pattern axe and it's my favorite it's a true temper it's seen a lot of use but I picked this one because it's still serviceable it's worn but still has good life in it the edge is not ground too radical on it I'm gonna clean up the axe head a little bit before we rehang it what I've got here is <laughs> some erasers, I guess. It's rubber impregnated with grit. It comes in, uh, I think, three different grits. This one's coarse. This one's fine. It's called the Wonder Bar. They're inexpensive. They're great. You just scrub it like that, and it takes the rust off, cleans it up. They're good for taking pitch when you're using your axe in the woods. So the first thing we're going to do is to saw the old handle off 
at this point right here to cut it off. I just prefer a coping saw because it keeps it nice and close. Sometimes it helps to relieve the wedge, the wood wedge that's down in here before you drive it out. And a good way to do that is to drill it out. Just drill a series of holes down through it. The tools to use on this are drifts or swedges. This one's for a single bit. You can see the shape of it is like a single bit. And here's a double bit. Put it right on the top like this. Take a hand sledge, about a two pound, and start to drive it out. There it goes. And we're clear. Now, you'll read, you'll read in some old books sometimes that another way to get the handle out is to put it in a fire and burn it out. Never attempt that. There's too much risk of drawing the temper or retempering the edges. Now we're going to hang the axe. Have you heard the expression, can't get the hang of it? That came from this operation. When an axe is hung, if it just doesn't fit you right, it just doesn't feel right, then you can't get the hang of it. And that's where the expression got started. Now before we hang it, I want to show you exactly where it should go. The axe head should always be right down. You can see this swell right here on the shoulder on the handle. When it's finished and it's properly hung, it should look like that, as opposed to if it was only put in to the end. Notice how far down the shoulder would be at this point. So we're going to cut that much of the top off. Mark it. Then cut that off. Primary tool for this is a rasp. Now this is a straight rasp with a file handle on it. Works like that. But this is a really useful tool. It's called a four in hand. And it's made by Nicholson File Company. And what it's got is got a flat rasp. It's got a curved rasp, and then it's got a flat double cut and a curved double cut file on it. It's a perfect tool to use, but when you're using that tool, you want to be wearing leather gloves to protect your hands from the serrations on the rasp itself. Okay, so it's just a matter of working it down now. So let's look at it for fit to start off with here. See where we are with it. Okay, it's a little bit too fat, a little bit too long. I'm going to have to take some off the sides here. And some in here. Let's start with the edges. Now a rasp you can use in a back and forth motion, although it tends to clog it up, unlike a file, which should never be used in a back and forth motion, only pushed away from you. When it clogs up like that, you can take a brush, a wire brush, and clean it out. I'm going to work both sides down, and then I'm going to work the cheeks of it down here as well. It's time to give it a try for the first time, but I'm going to bevel this edge just slightly, help it slide into the, the eye on the axe. Let's take it out, start it down in there, get it snug, turn it upside down, take your wooden mallet, hit it good and square, hold it up in the air like this. You can hear it. 
You can feel it. I can even feel when it stops, when it shoulders up. You want to hit it good and square so you don't split the, the swell out. It's about shouldered up. Huh. Not bad for a first try. Okay, let's uh, back the handle out a little bit here. You can see right here where it was shouldering up and rubbing. You can see that it was a good tight fit through here. You notice the places where it's high. So we're going to take a little bit more down through here. A little bit of this, the high spots right here. And then I'm going to feather this up so it's a good comfortable transition there instead of an abrupt transition. Because I think this is going to be our last, our last fit. So before we try it again, we're going to put the, the kerf to the right depth. Now's the time to do that because we probably won't have to take it out again. So get it locked in there real good. Get your saw. And you can see it needs to be about yay much deeper, about two-thirds of the way of the depth of the head. Take a look at it here. Yep. Okay, time to try it again. Put it back on. Now, it'd be a good time to sight down it. Looks like the edge is in line, so it's going on square. Now that we've driven the, the handle all the way home, you'll notice that the edge is a little bit higher, uneven on this side. If you remember, we just cut this off rough. The important thing is that it's square here and that the edge is in line with the handle. Take the coping saw again. Follow the contour. Be careful at this point so you don't break it. And there it's trimmed off perfectly flush. If you look at the edge here, you'll see that it's pretty thin. It doesn't have much for expansion. So in order to get the wedge down in a little bit further, that's why I'm taking some of the thickness out of it. To drive the wedge home, you need a good stout block or floor. And you're going to set the axe, the butt of the handle, right on that. Going to take one extra step that I like to do. There's this stuff on the market now, and you probably have gathered that I don't like new, new things, but this is, uh, this is great stuff. It's called Swell Lock. Just pour it down in and on the end grain. Put it on the wedge. Put the wedge in. And this is how you drive the wedge home. Now, hopefully, I'll hit this square on. What you want to do is try and get it so that you're hitting this square, and then just drive it home. It's bottomed out right now. It's not going to go any more than that. I don't, I don't know if you can hear the difference in the, in the tone, but uh, it's tight right now. So, now all we have to do is trim the, trim the wedge off. So back to the vise. Cover our edge up again, get our glove on, our coping saw. Notice how much softer this poplar is than the hickory was to cut off. It just flies right through it. Easy on the end here so you don't split it. Oh yeah. Even worked out. And there it is.
properly fixed, properly hung. Never, never put the steel wedges in cross grain that you sometimes see in axes like this right here. Why in the world would you want to split the grain, which this does, after you've just hung an axe? I kind of like to run a little sandpaper over it and clean it up a little bit. Where we had the, the rasp, and then run your sandpaper over the waxed surface here. Take some of the wax finish off that they've put on, get it good and clean and smooth. Do the whole handle like that. All right, now this is personal preference, but after I've sanded it down for purchase, or so you can get a good grip on the butt here, I like to take and rough it up with the rasp or the fore in hand. So just take it and run it across the grain like that. And the last thing in the step is to oil it with linseed oil. And this is pure raw linseed oil. You can use a boiled linseed oil, works just as well. I just happen to like the ha. Hadn't been open for a while. Take a rag. Just put a little bit on it. Put it on the, on the butt. Rub it on the top real good. And then rub the oil into the handle real good. After you finish, Wipe the excess off and be sure to throw your oily rag away. Spontaneous combustion with oily rags is absolutely uh, a hazard. I've seen them burst into flames before, so throw it away when you're done. Time to sharpen our axe now. First, let's take a look at the tools that we use. Primary tool is a file, single cut mill bastard file, 12s, 10s, 8 inch. You need to have a guard on it and a good handle. An old piece of harness leather with a hole punched in it makes a real good guard. A little block of wood, circular piece of leather, even a piece of fire hose works good. Some handles you drive, drive the file down in. Others, there we go. Others have screw thread on it that you screw onto the end. And then there's this kind, which is a clamp. And it'll fit any size file, and you just clamp it down. A file card, absolutely essential tool for cleaning the filings out of the file. It's even got, this one's even got a little pick in the end of it right here for picking pieces of metal to get stuck out. Gotta have that. The stones, traditional axe, round axe stone, which is two-sided with a fine and a coarse side. This is real good for carrying in the woods with you. You can put it in your pocket. Here's a a new type of a stone to me anyway that's uh, an axe stone and it's got a groove in the center between the fine and the coarse side and that really protects your fingers. Before we start sharpening let's take a look at the double bit axe. One edge is sharpened differently than the other. Your good edge, your chopping edge, is sharpened at the 25 degrees the other edge is much steeper and a blunter, a steeper angle, and that's your grubbing edge. You cut roots in the ground with it, branches that are near the ground where you might hit rocks, and that saves your good edge. Now the way that, and this is a personal preference, but the way that I always tell at a glance what my good cutting edge is, 
I put the trade name, True Temper. If you're chopping right-handed, you hold an axe like this with your left hand here at the handle, your right hand here. If you're standing like this and you can read True Temper on it, then this is your good chopping edge. Let's put it in the little vise I got. It's good and tight. I do one more thing. I take a little wedge and run it underneath like that to sort of raise the edge up and give it support when I'm filing. Now for safety, always with this process, all the way through both gloves, and you have the protectors on the files. Now the process is to file away from the edge. You always sharpen away from the edge in that motion. And the thing I want to stress to you here, again, is like with the rasp, you clean it out, but you only use the file in one direction, and that's pushing forward. Now, as far as the files go, I have two preferences. One is Simon's and one is Nicholson, two good American-made files. So that's the filing motion, but there's a little nick in the edge right here. The shape is good. It needs to have a little bit of rounding to it, but it shouldn't be rounded off too much. What I would do at this point with that nick in the edge there is I would true up the edge by running the file this way. And this is how you can straighten an edge if the, or reshape an edge if the edge isn't correct. It just flattens it out, but it takes, takes all of the nicks out of it. So I'm going for this 25 degrees right here, except it's not a straight, it's a little too thick, see it? It's too thick back in here, so I'm going to have to file the cheek off right here some. But it's not a straight 25. It, it shouldn't be a straight edge on it. It should have a slight curve to it like, like that. And you might be able to see that. The finished shape is going to be a, a half moon like this with it filed more back here into the, into the cheek. Now remember, I'm not sharpening this. I'm bringing it back. I'm rehabbing this axe and then sharpening it. If you take care of your axe, you can touch it up in 15 minutes with a file and the stones. But when you're starting from, well, starting over with, with one, it takes about an hour to do that. After the filing, it's time for the ax stones. I'll use the safe one here. Still use your gloves. This is a sharpening oil. Um, Norton, the people that make the stones, also make this honing oil. So we'll put some on the on the coarse side, sort of let it soak in, rub it around. That makes a really good lubricant there. And then what I do is hold it in my hand like this under my arm and again you're working away from the edge but this time in a circular motion with the coarse side. Always away from the edge, into the edge like this. So periodically, oh that's looking pretty good actually. You have to take and wipe the the grit of the stone and the steel off and then put a little bit more oil on if it dries out. Still got a little bit on there. Whoop, whoop, come back here. Same thing. Now when you're finished with the core side and you do this side, then you flip it over and I hold it like this and I do this side, okay, like so. As soon as you feel a wire edge, then you go to the fine side of the stone and do the same thing on both sides. 
and you go from one side to the other and you push the wire edge back and forth until it's real, real thin, then what I do is I strop it. And a piece of wood will work pretty good. Just sort of draw it, strop the wire edge one side to the other across a piece of wood like that and it'll break the wire edge off. We're all the way through the process of sharpening now, but you need to test the edge. So let's switch to the finished product here. And out of the oven comes the finished one here. Hopefully you can see this is the shape. If you can see the sharpening here on this, this is the shape that, that I'm looking for in the finished grind. It's that crescent shape and takes the, the thick part out. I've got the label up on this, and this is a bluegrass. You notice that that's a perfect fit. But if you look at the edge in a light, in a strong light, the sun over your shoulder, and I mean look right at the edge, the very edge, it should not reflect light. If it reflects light, you don't have a sharp edge on any edge tool. So looking right straight down at the edge in the light, I see no reflections here. So that means, theoretically, it means that I've got it sharp. Now, there is a technique where you can use your thumbnail, and it should bite in and not slip off for sharpness. but. My favorite technique is if the edge is sharp enough to dry shave the hair off your arm, then it's sharp enough to use. So here goes. Yes, indeed it is. That's sharp enough for me right there. One last thing you need to do, and that's protect the axe head. What I like to do is put a little bit of lubricating oil, take some beeswax, a little block of it. The oil cuts the beeswax. And since I'm working on an unsheathed axe, I should put my gloves on. You just kind of rub it in. And like I said, the oil cuts the beeswax and it gives it a real good sticky coating that stays on it that comes and you wipe the excess off. And it, it comes right off when you go to chop, but it keeps it from rusting. One last thought on sharpening for you. Now let's go over here. This is a high speed grinder. Do not use these on your axes. It'll draw the temper out of the axe, burns the edge, ruins a good axe. Use a file, then use your axe stone. If you need to grind an old pedal grindstone like we started out on, it's a real good choice if you have one available. Well, you say we go to the woods and use the axe now.
let's start our look at axes with the history of the axe. Now the axe went from stone to flint to copper to bronze to iron and then to steel like the modern axe today. Now the earliest axe that I have in my collection is this 17th century trade axe and it still has some of the touch marks on it here from the original maker. Now this axe has no pole on it and you'll notice that this is a 1930s Collins that was a trade axe to South America that also is made with no pole. Now, what's wrong with this axe for today's standards is that there's no weight behind the, the, the blade. It wobbles. It has a speed wobble when you use it. This was actually an 18th century splitting maul. Still has what looks like the original handle in it. And then of course we have the, the hewing axe, side axe, or better known as a broad axe. This is a Germanic goose wing, and you can see also the touch marks in it. Now this one here you'll notice, there's just a, tra this is a transitional axe here, and it has a hint of a pole on it. An 18th century shingling hatchet and a related tool which is the woodworkers adds. Now it looks like a grub hoe but it's not. It's for woodworking. It's not quite as old as the axe but we're going to take a look at the adds today also. Now around 1750 in North America some unknown blacksmith added the pole. Now the pole is the weight behind the handle and what it does is it gives a counterbalance to the blade weight. It eliminated that speed wobble that I talked about when you chop. We just had this single bit or pole wax because of the pole and this is a good old true temper as a matter of fact my father gave me this axe when I was 14 and went into the woods now it's hung with a straight handle on it instead of a fawn's foot or a curved handle it's a jersey pattern it's my personal favorite as far as a pattern goes because it has a short bit wide cutting edge and it also has bevels ground in it which are for easy release in in sticky wood this one here is a Michigan and it's got a rounded pole on it a little bit longer bit a little bit fatter this happens to be a Winchester manufactured by the the firearms maker and the Michigan is also still being manufactured and a, and a good serviceable axe not my personal favorite as far as a pattern goes. The last one that's really still around is called a Dayton pattern and this is a four pound Dayton. It's square. You notice it has a large pole on it, a long bit, and it has the Fawn's foot handle. You probably notice that the different head patterns are more or less geographic. And that's because early development of the axe was by blacksmiths in certain geographic locations and also to suit the timber in those locations. Like a Michigan axe was well suited to the timber in Michigan. This is an Australian axe. It's an Australian wood axe, but the head pattern is very much like a Connecticut. It's not one of the uh, competition axes, and we'll look at a competition axe in a minute. But it's about a six pound with a straight handle. Still being manufactured today. And as always, we should say a word about safety with an ax. Should always wear eye protection. These are safety glasses. You notice that I don't wear gloves. I don't wear gloves because I need purchase or a grip on the ax handle. When my hands get sweaty, I can't get that with gloves. 
but there are times when gloves, leather gloves, are appropriate. Now your axe should always have a good leather sheath on it and you should wear good leather boots and remember a sharp axe is a safe axe. How about some double bits here? This is a cruiser head pattern. It's two and a half pound with a 28 inch handle on it and um, it's very convenient to carry in the woods with you. That head pattern is still being manufactured. There are only a couple of double bit patterns still around. Used to be a lot more. This is a Michigan double bit. It also is a true temper, Kelly Perfect, has the bevels ground in it. You'll notice it sort of has the same round configuration that the single bit Michigan. The last double bit is a western pattern and the one we use most out here in Montana. You'll notice that the western has a little bit of an upsweep to it. This one also has the bevels ground in it and um, it uh, is a council tool company which is a manufacturer out of North Carolina that's still making good quality axes. It's called the Classic line because of the bevels here. This one has an octagonal handle on it also, a slim tapered octagonal handle. One last axe to show you is a full-blown Australian competition. This is a tuatahi and um, it's used in competitive work. It's very thinly honed here and would not be good for woods. Now there's a few other shorter axes. This one is generally known as a boy's axe with a little 26 inch or 28 inch handle on it. But what I use this for is I use this for years as a a wedge driving axe in the timber felling process on the back cut to drive the wedge. It has a nice heavy pole on it. Now the pole on an axe is there for the weight and it's not meant to drive steel or iron pins, wedges, whatever. The wedges that we drive with this are either wood or modern plastic wedges so it doesn't do damage to the axe. This is a little Swedish axe manufactured by, and I hope I'm saying this right, Grand Fours Bronx. That's close enough. It's good Swedish steel. When I sharpened it, I could tell it takes a really good edge. It has good temper. And I think they call it their woodsman pattern. It might be a good choice for you. An axe, if it's used properly, is a real safe tool. An axe, if you cut corners, it can be a real dangerous tool. The one thing that we've seen in the past that have been injury related and injuries to ankles or feet has come down to one simple thing. If when you're chopping on a log, if you never let your axe handle break a plane that's parallel with the ground as you're chopping, then you can't cut your feet. And the only time we break that rule is when we're chopping with the log between our body and the axe head. If you've already made the decision to chop the log, the first thing I do again is look at the log, figure out what I'm going to do with it. Where's the best place to chop it? If you're limbing on a downed log, you should try to have, try to be limbing the log on the opposite side from where you're standing. In other words, keep the log between you and your, and your axe. The second part is when you're limbing, a lot of times you'll see that the axe head goes through some of the limbs really easy. So it's pretty easy to get wild in a situation like that. So you should be really clear on where other people are and you should be really clear on where your swing is going. Yeah, there's a lot of times when no matter how hard you try, you have to limb on the same side of the log that you're standing on. And when that happens, just be doubly sure never to let your axe handle or your axe head drop below the level of your hands as you're chopping. The third is when you're swinging is to make sure that you have a clear area in the complete, within the complete radius or arc of your swing. 
when you're doing that, you don't want your ax when it's over your head even to hit a little branch. So sometimes there might be a little branch that's out of the radius of your swing, but it's going to be catching your eye and it's going to be interfering with your vision the whole time. And if that's there, take the time to remove it. It's trying to be as sufficient as possible. So you're going to strike that wood as many times as it takes to completely sever your cutting surface and then move to the other side. Instead of making a chop on one side, a chop on the other side, a chop on this side, a chop on this side, three times in succession and then breaking it. Oftentimes in a large log, you're not going to be able to remove your first chips by making a wide cut. So you start with a narrower V in your cut and you'll cut down until your V comes to closure or to a point and then you'll go back up and usually on the strongest side that you have, you'll reopen your cut so that it's wider. And as you come down at first, you take a lot of care to develop accuracy. It doesn't matter. The power does not matter at first. Again, I'm flexing at the knees, especially when I get near this part of the cut, so my axe handle stays parallel. So work on your accuracy as you're coming down. And only after you have that balance and that accuracy, then power becomes the third part of the equation. Wait until you're good at chopping before you try to put power into it. A lot of times when you're swinging, and you pick the axe up and it goes back past your head on either side and you'll catch out of the corner of your eye a little chip of wood that's stuck on the axe blade. You should not try to power through that chip. When you try to power down through it, it can deflect your axe and you can end up with an injury. Then there's always the splitting maul. This is a six pound maul. It's an axe eye instead of a sledge eye maul, which I prefer the feel of the handle on. Good splitting tool. Now, I'm not one much for newfangled gadgets. I like tradition. But here's a splitting axe called the Super Splitter. And it's got a little flare on the side here. And it works real good. I'm real impressed with it. It comes in two sizes, this being the smaller, and then there's a little bit heavier version of it. A real quick look at wood splitting here. The uh, splitting maul, six pound splitting maul, and splitting is a matter of concentrating your energy. Put your, put your body weight into it. The last splitting tool is just a single bit axe. With an axe, which doesn't have much of a wedged shape to it. And I'm going to take my gloves off here for this so I can feel the handle real good. There's an old timer's trick that if you, and I'll do this in slow motion, if you twist the axe right at the point of impact, it'll throw the wood apart and the axe won't stick in it. Let's try this uh, twisting motion again. There we go. Man, I'm hot now. Now the broad axe is my personal favorite of all edge tools to use. Start off with my grandfather's broad axe. It's a big one. It's uh, about nine pounds and you'll notice that it has more or less of an original offset handle. This is a Pennsylvania pattern broad axe and it's made by William Beatty and Son out of Chester, Pennsylvania. And now there's three fairly common um, 20th century and 19th century patterns of Pennsylvania being one of them. And I'll show you two others here. Fancy sheath here. Oops. This is called a New Orleans pattern. And you'll notice that it's clipped off on the edges. It has a pretty large pole 
What I really like about this pattern is that it has more of a curve to it. Now, a broad axis, basically it's flat on this side and the bevel or the basal edge is all on this side. This has a dog leg handle, which is just an offset, a single offset handle as opposed to the S-band. So Pennsylvania, New Orleans, and Canadian pattern. This one still has the maker's sticker on it, even though it's a historic axe. The Canadian pattern has this little bevel right through here, and that distinguishes the Canadian pattern axe. You do have a choice, though, between historic and modern. There's a fellow in North Carolina, Bear Creek Tools, that's the first one to come up with a well-made broad axe. And by well-made, he under, Charlie understands the geometry of a broad axe. It's got the curve to it this way, the flat side. It's, uh, it's hung properly. This is a good choice for you for a modern manufactured broad axe. We're back to the Swedish tools here. And this is a European or a Swedish broad axe. Now it's a knife edge. It's not, it's basaled, beveled on both sides. I tried this and it works quite well actually. The actual healing process starts with scoring of the log. And there's a couple of different techniques for scoring. Uh, let's start off with the most difficult, which is to chop a V-notch. And on a larger diameter like this, a V-notch is the best way to remove the bulk of the wood before you go to the broad axe. So what we do here is carefully cut a notch into the depth of the line and then come over here and you keep, you keep cutting these V-notches into the depth of the line. Before you go too far down, you go like this, and you split the bulk of it. And again, carefully, all this work is best done from on top of the log. Um, you can score from the ground, but it means that you have to rotate the log more than one time. So this is called, this process is called juggling. The most common method of scoring is slash scoring, and those are the marks that you usually find on the log and usually done with a smaller diameter. The idea is to set up a rhythm as you work your way down the log, scoring again to the chalk line. Um, and if you can get them evenly spaced and placed uh, each shot one right over the other, it makes for a better, more traditional look. So we'll see whether I can do that for you or not. That's the scoring, slash scoring process. And uh, it's uh, we're trying to get, keep the marks three to four inches apart and one over top of the other. There's a little, if you would, there's a little dance that, that goes with this, a shuffling motion that you do to keep the rhythm going on it, to keep your even spacing. The hewing process is one of removing the rest of the wood to the line. That sometimes on a larger diameter log like this, that sometimes takes two tries at each side. And that would be score and score with the, with the pole axe, hew with the broad axe, come back and score the last time to the line, and again use the broad axe to finish. Traditional broad axe work worked forward with it. 
the terminology bark your knuckles came from this historic process where as you're chopping like this your knuckles are in jeopardy on the log that's why historically you hew forward creates more room for your hands the handle is offset this is a dog leg offset to give you a little bit more hand room in there now I also like to hew backwards even though it puts my fingers in more jeopardy barking my knuckles because I can see the plane that I've just worked on and it gives me a better sight line if I go that way but we'll start here and do it in a traditional fashion the broad axe is raised and lowered in an easy motion it's not swung real hard I should mention that historically and even today it's necessary to work on a green stick this process doesn't work very well at all on a dry log it just splits it out so you can see I'm working forward with the process here the finished product after it's dressed off you're taking thin shavings and some of them are quite thin for an axe and it leaves a fairly smooth smooth surface with just a hint of the scoring marks left in it when you're using the broad axe if you miss especially on these thin shavings sometimes the axe will go on by let it go on by don't let it go into the dirt and the rocks the wood chip build up will keep the save the edge but don't try and pull a missed shot like that these axes are heavy enough as they are if you do it all day long uh, your forearms will be burning actually your forearms will be burning at the end of the day anyway with this because it's mostly forearm work so don't pull it and if you get if you get a chip stuck on the axe edge when you go and stop and remove it otherwise you'll get a glancing blow and you should keep this leg tight and I'm hewing right-handed right now keep this leg tight and this leg out of harm's way Let's take a look at the foot ads. We started off with the 18th century. It has a pin pole here. Now this was for hammering on. It's all hand forged. A modern day would be this carpenter's and it has a half pole on it. This is a Douglas. This is the one I use every day in log work. And it has a Carpenter's Ads handle on it. The Shipwrights has a little bit different handle to it. This is a modern manufactured Shipwrights. This is a lipped Shipwrights. I don't want to have to say that fast, but um, the lip here keeps the edges from digging in. The traditional way to use this tool is to stand on top of the log and chop right towards your feet. So I'm going to do that while I'm looking at my feet.
The ads is actually a plane. It's a dressing tool that takes down the surface. Uh, when broadaxe hewn logs uh, were dressed up for parlor beams, they were planed off. And you'll notice that it leaves a smoother finish, although undulating, but also a fairly thin shaving. And in a lot of cases, not much, not much thicker than a plain shaving blade. How about we look at some hatchets? Hatchet is just a shorter version of the axe. Since we looked at double bits, here's a little double bit hatchet. It's uh, about a pound and a half. Good little camp tool. Hatchets have different head patterns for different purposes. More than geographic names, the name relates to the use. This is a claw hatchet. and You can see it has a a nail pulling claw to it. This is one of my favorites for rough log construction. And then we have a broad hatchet. Like the broad axe, it's beveled on one side, flat on the other side. Unlike the broad axe, the handle is straight in it though. And it's a small hewing tool. Shingle hatchet has a flared bit on it. You'll notice that this particular make has the bevels ground in it for release. And then we have your hunter's axe here, or hunter's hatchet. And it has a nail pulling device here, which is useless in my opinion. Doesn't work well. But the shape of it is very much like the Michigan or the Dayton axe pattern. This is an odd thing that appeared for a number of years and only by true temper, and it's called a tommy axe. It has a head shape like a tomahawk. It has a pole for driving, and it also has a little claw on it for pulling. For more information on axes, we have an axe manual that's a companion to this video program. There's also a video that we made for historic preservation called These Old Cabin Logs, and it's on log cabin restoration. You might be interested in that. And then there's Hand Tools for Trail Work video. Now this is as close as you're going to get to seeing this cowboy dance. He's up in the morning at the break of day. With his axe and the file and the lunch packed away And he's off to the woods where he'll earn his pay It's all in the life of the woodsman He swings his axe with truth and grace To strengthen his arms and pound on his face He'll carry it with him till the day he dies There's a lesson to be learned for the woodsman The handle shaped by his hand Up to the next tree firmly he stands The chips fly fast, each swing is true There's music in the movement of the woodsman He swings his axe with truth and